Thessalonians chapter 1. I've, I've handed out a, a summary of the things we've been looking at about convictions. We've had a few breaks, and it's, it's been a bit hit and miss with Christmas and a few things, but uh, the subject is a great one, and really every week we're talking about convictions, and we're, we're seeing what the Bible says and uh, how we should live. I, I don't know where I got it, but I just finished reading a book about honestly living what we say we believe. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's important as, as Christians, one, to know what we believe, but then as well to, to live it. Uh, you know, we need to, to believe that God is sovereign, that his Bible is the inspired word. You know, there's just a lot of areas where we need to have God's wisdom and know what the truth is. Um, now, I don't know if you've ever looked for it, but the word conviction is not in the Bible. <laughs> kind of like the subject this morning, the word Trinity. It's not in the Bible, but the truth is. And uh, the fact that we need to have convictions is, uh, I don't think anyone would, uh, any Christian would, uh, would doubt that. There's a couple of words, though, that uh, pretty well hit that. And uh, one is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 there and, and verse 5. It's the word assurance. Usually we think of assurance in relation to salvation. That's what he's dealing, dealing with here. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Very similar to the, this word that we're talking about, conviction. Uh, assurance means fullness of faith. When you have assurance, uh, you have a fullness of faith. that This is what God has said. This is what I should do. Let me tell you, you need that when it comes to salvation. You don't want to be depending on your feelings. You don't want to be depending on your hormones. Uh, you don't want to be depending on a circumstance or a ceremony. You'd be amazed the stories I've heard as to what people attribute to their salvation. Uh, the strangest one, I think, was a guy said that he, was, he knew he was saved because he fell off the tractor. I guess God knocked him off or something. I don't know. I think he thought he was the modern Apostle Paul, maybe. But we need convictions about our salvation. The way to know we're saved is by God's Word. It's not by something we've done. It's by something God has done. Now, don't base uh, your convictions on feelings or circumstances. But as well, in Hebrews chapter 10, he uses this word assurance uh, in regard to living by faith. And like I mentioned, this is probably what we... This is probably often what we think of when we think of convictions is how we live. Hebrews 10 verse 22 says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. He's just talking about living a pure life. We need to have assurance as we go about our, our daily lives that what we're doing is, is right and, and godly. We need convictions about how we live. You know, how should I live? You know, what should I believe? Well, God's word is what, what tells me. We need assurance. We need conviction. The other word that comes up, and that's in Hebrews as well, Hebrews chapter 3, is the word confidence. Now, pardon me, but one of the ways I found these, these words was uh, some of the other translations use the word conviction. And uh, these are the words that, that they used. Uh, assurance, confidence. Confidence literally means to stand under. It's a military term. Uh, when you have a commander, uh, you stand under. You're under their authority. You have submission because of trust. And uh, that's what he's talking, uh, that's what this word talks about. Hebrews 3, verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Now, let me back up just a little bit and go back to verse 12 and read. I'm going to read all the way down through the end of the chapter. I want you to see this, this whole thing. Verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, Today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, 
whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They didn't have convictions. They didn't have confidence in what God was doing, in what God's leader was, was doing. Uh, if you don't live by convictions, if you don't live by assurance, confidence, faith, you won't have rest. You know, there's, there's no rest if you don't base what you believe on God's word. There'll be turmoil. And that's what Israel experienced. You know, they decided what Moses had said and what, what he told them God had said was, was not right. And man, it, it caused havoc. And listen, it'll cause havoc in your Christian life if you don't have assurance and confidence. That's interesting. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, that same word confidence is translated substance. I found this really interesting. I enjoy this kind of thing. He says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the confidence of things hoped for. And I think what he's saying there is uh, your convictions will determine the substance of your Christian life. You know, what you believe, your faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. If you don't believe God's word, the substance of your life is, is not going to be godly. If you believe God's word and by faith apply it, it's going to change the substance of your life. Some of you have experienced that. You've taken steps by faith and, man, it makes a turning. Now, faith is the substance. It's Hebrews 11.1. 1. Uh, your convictions, your faith. Convictions will decide how you live. And that's the point of all this. Uh, we want to have lives that please the Lord. You know, the world will change. Culture will change. Constantly changing. Um, I mean, who would have thought that all three men on the, on the platform this morning would wear pink shirts? Can you believe it? And there's a time when, when uh, and, and I'm not kidding, there's a time when people would have said, oh, that's sin, brother. Uh, we need to be careful that we're, we're looking to the Lord for what we believe and what we understand. And I want to give you uh, seven characteristics of conviction tonight. Uh, the first is very simple. Real convictions must be Bible. Real convictions have to come from God's Word. You know, a, lot of, a lot of times convictions are things that people just make up. I've got this conviction, and, and it doesn't come from the Bible. Uh, in, we read in Hebrews 3.15 where, where he said, uh, If you'll hear His voice, while it is said today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts. Um, you know, our convictions should not stem from us. It shouldn't stem from someone else. You know, that, that's oftentimes what a cult is. You know, the leader will say, you've got to do this. Oh, we've got to do that. And in, re in reality, it's easier to follow someone than to decide for yourself. Be careful. Uh, real convictions come from the Bible. Now, I, I think I need to point out that some people have convictions that are not scriptural. I mentioned one already. Um, I, I looked some of these up, and I, you know, I was racking my brain to think about different ones, and I don't want to make too big a deal of it, but, uh, you know, some people used to have, a, they would call it a conviction that men can only wear white shirts to church. Man, we're all sinning here tonight. Um, you can't be happy at church. You, you know, to have any joy, laughing, that, that would be wrong. Uh, Christians can't eat pork. Uh, Christian men should not have facial hair. Now, you can have eyebrows, but, you know, not, not beards. Well, you know, and, and I'm just saying, different times, different places, uh, different things that people sometimes would call them convictions. But they didn't come from, from the Bible. And we need to be careful. Uh, real convictions must be Bible. Secondly, real convictions must be mixed with faith. Uh, we read there in Hebrews 3. Uh, turn back there, Hebrews 3, if, if you're not there. Now, the last verse of the chapter, verse 19, he says, so, that, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Chapter 4. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being less left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. So we're Hebrews 4, verse 2 now. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed to enter into rest. See, God's word speaks. And that's, that's number one. But then we have to respond by faith. 
Faith uh, makes a difference. Real faith, the Bible says, will change us. It has a work. Faith without works is dead. Uh, the Bible is where we get our faith. Faith leads us to how we live, our, our actions. So number one is real conviction must be Bible. Secondly, real conviction must be by faith. And that will lead us to rest. It doesn't mean that we'll necessarily have physical rest. Because sometimes when you live by your Bible convictions, by faith, Bible convictions, man, uh, I, I was reading today, you know, some people get terribly persecuted for living by faith. <coughs> but you have rest in knowing that you're right with God. You have rest in knowing that you're, you're doing what's right. Uh, the, the rest of these are in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, if you could turn there. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. So number one, it must be Bible. Number two, it must be mixed with faith. It's not enough just to know. We've got to believe it and act upon it. Then 1 Corinthians 16, 13, and 14, I think give us five more. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong, let all your things be done with charity. There's probably many things that we could, we could apply here. But number three, real convictions require personal alertness and responsibility. Real convictions need to be personal. You need to take responsibility. He, he uses two words there, watch ye. Watch. Uh, in, in Peter, he says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That's your personal responsibility. Now, we do, we do have a responsibility to each other. But if you're going to have a conviction, you've got to have a conviction. And then he says, ye. Uh, you know, it's not... You get it from somebody else. Use all the good resources you can, but be personally responsible for your, your convictions. Don't be careless. You know, don't just go along with the crowd. Don't just um, have the family God. You need to know the Lord. You need to follow the Lord. Uh, we have things that we believe like soul liberty. You know, we, we have a, a tie that binds. We have church and so on. But you know, as individuals, we have soul liberty. We have to believe what we believe because that's what we believe God says, not just because someone else says it. Uh, we have the priesthood of the believers. You know, we don't go through someone else to get to God. You go through Christ. I go through Christ. We all go through Christ, not through some human being. There's not someone who has to tell us what to do. Uh, we have the Holy Spirit. Uh, it has to be your belief. So first it's Bible. It's by faith. It's got to be your belief. I've heard, you know, when you first get saved, sometimes you kind of hang on to the coattail of somebody. But listen, don't do that all your life. Don't just ride somebody's coattail all your life. Number four, real convictions will stand the test of time. He says, stand fast in the faith. Persevering. Um, be true to God's standards. This won't be something that is just here today and gone tomorrow. A real conviction doesn't change. It's in the faith. Stand fast in the faith. Now look at Hebrews chapter 6, if you would. We'll, we'll be looking at the, those phrases from 1 Corinthians 16. But Hebrews 6, verse 10, or verse 11. He says, We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. We have hope unto the end. Uh, we're going to... Persevere with, with what we believe. Go back to verse 10. He says, Hebrews 6.10, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints, and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Real convictions persevere. It doesn't just uh, you know, have a, a brief time in our life. But let me, let me point something out here. Not everything we live as, Christian, as Christians is conviction. That's right. Not everything is going to be by conviction. I, I have a, an article by uh, the Christian attorney David Gibbs. And he talks about the difference between a preference and a conviction. Some things in life, you can do it this way, I can do it that way, we can do it different, and it's okay. You know, it's not a conviction. God doesn't say, you've got to do it this way. 
Some churches meet at 9.30. Some churches meet at 10. That can't be right. 10.30. Uh, I'm being facetious there, but uh, real, real convictions will stand the test of time. And we need to be careful that we're not making preferences into convictions. Preferences can be very strong. You know, preferences can change your life. Uh, you can have a, a preference to, uh, to be called as a missionary. But you know what? God can change that as well. We, we've known folks who God has called them to one thing, and then he calls them to something else. That's, God can do that. Uh, it can cause you to sacrifice greatly. We're not saying that preferences are unimportant, but they can change. Sometimes through circumstances, uh, sometimes by threat of jail. Say, okay, I'll, I'll quit doing that. <laughs> um, but a conviction doesn't, and that's the difference. Uh, conviction stands the test of time. It won't change because, number one, it's something God requires. And two, it's something you live with consistency. That's one of the things he talked about in his, his article was that when it comes to court about a conviction, it's got to be something that you can show this is what God says I have to do, and two, you've got to be able to show you've been doing it. <laughs> you haven't been ignoring it. Uh, you know, it has to be something we live with consistency. Our life and our words need to match. You know, it's no good saying, I have a conviction Christians shouldn't watch TV and then have a TV and watch it. You know, it's no good saying, well, you know, Christians have to send their kids to Christian school, but uh, we live in a town that doesn't have one, so ours are going to public school. That's not a conviction. That's a preference. Um, the greatest, I think, probably example in Scripture is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had a conviction. You know, when the king said, bow down to this idol, they said, no. You know, everybody else bowed down. They, they didn't need the crowd's approval. And stop and think about it. A lot of those were young men just like them who'd been taken from Israel. Why weren't they standing up? Well, they didn't have the conviction. And then they were threatened with death. You don't bow down, we'll throw you in the fiery furnace. Their answer was immediate. We don't even have to think about that. <laughs> that was a conviction. And they were thrown in the, you, you know the story. Uh, that's a conviction when it doesn't change by circumstances and it's something that you know God, God requires. Uh, I gave you a list of, of ten convictions. You know, there's just things that, that we need to understand are, are from, from God's word. Uh, you need to have a conviction about your, your church life, uh, about your, your home life, your affections, your money your purpose, especially that God is sovereign in his word, uh, that the Bible is, is his word. Uh, we need to have convictions about things. Uh, a conviction must be by faith in God's word. Uh, we're, uh, we, we need to make it personal, and we need to persevere. Uh, fifthly, real convictions require bravery. Back in Corinthians, he said, quit you like men. Ladies, quit you like men. <laughs> you know, he's just saying, we've, we've got to be... Uh, got to be brave about these things. It's not easy to live a Christian life. Even in a society like ours here, where we don't really feel under threat uh, physically. I don't know too many Australians who've been beaten up or physically suffered uh, you know, for Christ, but it could happen. It, it, it happens when everybody else is going to go somewhere on Sunday, but you're going to church. You have a conviction about it. Everybody else is going to drink, but you're not going to drink because you have a conviction about it. Now, let me tell you, if, if you don't drink alcohol in Australia, you don't fit in with the average. It's a conviction. Um, you know, the average Australian is not real happy when you witness to them, but you have a conviction, so you do it. And, and I've found this. When they get saved, they're glad you told them. I've never had anybody say, oh, I wish you hadn't told me when they got saved. Uh, but, you know, we do it because of conviction, not because of convenience not a preference, and it takes bravery. Quit you like men. We've, we've got to understand that. The, the next one is similar. He says, be strong. It takes strength. Now, it doesn't take physical strength. It doesn't even really take mental strength. It takes spiritual strength. There's a verse in Ephesians that's been an encouragement to me. Ephesians 3, verse 16. The blessing here with when he says be strong is he offers us strength. <laughs> Ephesians 3.16 says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory 
to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Yeah, we don't have to come to the end. We don't have to give up. We're, we have available to us the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. God can give us strength. If we had Holiday Kids Club. I guess none of the kids are here from Holiday Kids Club. I was hoping Ash would be here. Uh, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You know, that's what we're talking about. Be strong. And we need to get it from the Lord. Well, the, the final thing is there in 1 Corinthians 16 and, and verse 14. Let all your things be done with charity. Let all your things be done with charity. Real conviction will be lived with kindness and love. Now, a real conviction won't cause us to be cruel or unkind or, or mean and nasty. Uh, you know, there, there's a temptation to it sometimes. You know, we want to give it to them. We were talking this morning about shooting everybody. Well, we didn't know. That's, that's, that's no good. Charity. It's the word agape. It means love. You know, God so loved the world. And, you know, love requires sacrifice. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Love requires sacrifice. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There's sacrifice involved with love. And real conviction will be lived with kindness and love. As well, Romans 12, 9, I found this interesting. I just looked up some of the different verses that had agape in it. Romans 12, 9 indicates that love requires honesty. Let love be without dissimulation. It shouldn't be hypocrisy in conviction. You know, the world hates hypocrisy. We're all hypocrites sometimes, but uh, we just, we really especially hate it in other people. You know, that's the nasty one. You know, us, we have an excuse, but... Uh, as Christians, we need to be careful that we're not dishonest. We're not uh, hypocrites with our, our convictions. There was a man, you, you've probably heard of him. Uh, in 1948, Richard Wormbrandt uh, was put in prison because of his convictions. One of the things I read is that they put him in prison because he said communism and Christianity were incompatible. It's true. And he was tortured. He wrote a book, Tortured for Christ. He spent a total of 14 years. He, he was out for a little while and then back in, uh, in prison. And in prison, he lived his convictions. He lived them bravely, he lived them openly, with kindness and with love. And God used him to reach people. And he said when he was released, he felt like he was leaving his ministry. Yeah, you know, he wouldn't have chosen that, but that's where God put him. And he lived by conviction with that, with that circumstance. Convictions. What do you believe? We had a friend who, before he was saved, used to love to irritate Christians by asking them curly questions. Until he said, finally, one day a girl said to him, well, Dave, what do you believe? And he had to stop and think. He, he didn't know. He ended up getting saved because of it. What do you believe? What would you be willing to go to prison for? What would you be willing to die for? We need to know. Listen, we don't want to die for something silly, something that's not, God doesn't call us to have a conviction. But there are things that are, are am I right in using the word immutable, you know, unchangeable? God has written it down. It's by faith that we believe it. We act upon it. We make it personal. It's between us and God. We, uh, we understand that that's how God would have us to live. Uh, living for the Lord by conviction, uh, I'll tell you, it'll change your life. It might take you places you never expected to go. But let me give you a warning. Compromise will do the same thing. Compromise will change your life. There's people who get to the end of their life and they look back and they say, boy, I wish I hadn't taken that turn in the road. Because it changed their life and it took them where they didn't want to be. Just ask Jonah. Ask Jonah about compromise. Convictions. There's a song, I'm sorry it's not in our hymnal. I'll live for him who died for me. My life, my love, I give to thee, thou Lamb of God who died for me. Oh, may I ever faithful be, my Savior and my God. He's, he's worthy of our lives. He's worthy of more than we could ever give him. We need to see what God says. 
We need to have assurance and confidence in our salvation. But we also need to have assurance and confidence and rest in how we live. Not worried that uh, whether what we're doing is what God wants us to do or not. Um, I thought we'd take our song book and sing the, the song, page 218, Living for Jesus. You know, maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart tonight. and Maybe there's just some areas where you, you're not sure what you should believe or you, you know that you're not following what God, God teaches. You know, you can, you can spend an awful lot of your life not working out what you believe, just kind of drifting. And really, it's not going to have the return that God wants you to have. I'd encourage you to really study your word, study the word of God, and uh, believe it, and then live it. It's got to be Bible. It's got to be by faith. It's got to be personal. It's going to take bravery, but God can help you.